Welcome to everyone. So it is a great pleasure today to have uh, Pietro Verona here with us. And he's going to give a talk uh, on visual recognition. And Pietro Verona is uh, a professor of electrical engineering and uh, computational and neural system at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, US, where he has been on faculty since uh, 1991. He's now also an uh, Amazon fellow. So he has also an uh, industry hat at the moment. Another important thing is that Pietro, uh, he's an alumnus of our university. So he graduated in uh, electrical engineering uh, in 1985, I think. And then after that, he got his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, working with uh, Jitendra Malik uh, in 1990. His research interests are in computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence more in general and also in human vision. He pioneered the study of visual categorization, including also the collection of uh, uh, the Caltech 101 dataset, which is one of the uh, fundamental uh, dataset used for object recognition, for which he was also awarded the Longer Higgins Prize in 2013. He's also the recipient of the 2010 Kendering Prize for Fundamental Contributions in Computer Vision again for his works uh, on uh, early works on learning models for visual recognition. Among the others, he did a lot of things uh, and uh, his research work includes also uh, the popular anisotropic diffusion technique, uh, modeling attention and visual search, visual categorization and analyzing behavior using vision. These are exciting days for people uh, like me working in computer vision because the, and also machine learning because the field now is mature. And we have a lot of uh, techniques that are really uh, having a huge impact in society. And I want to say that Pietro's early works on visual recognition have been for sure a fundamental step towards this uh, recent revolution. Finally, I would like to highlight also another for me impressive, uh, impressive achievement of Pietro Perona that is the incredible number of alumni from his uh, computational vision group at Caltech that now has uh, uh, have an uh, important position in, in both academia and uh, industry. Just to name a few, uh, Stefano Soato, who's also from Padova, uh, Pepe Lee and Silvia Savarese, that are professor in uh, Stanford, uh, Max Welling, uh, Serge Belongi, and so far so on. I have to admit that this is also uh, a kind of uh, excuse to say that because of my years at uh, Stanford uh, with uh, Pepe and Silvia, that both of them are uh, former PhD students of uh, uh, Pietro, I'm super proud to say that I'm, academically speaking, we are a sort of relatives. So this is another small connection between uh, Pietro and Padova. And hopefully we are going to have more connections in the future. So that's all. Thank you. And Thank you. I have a microphone here. Thank you, Lamberto, for inviting me. And thanks to the math department for, for having me here today. Um, <coughs> Since the topic is not entirely familiar to mathematicians, I thought I would cover um, uh, a few related topics just to indicate the possibilities of what can be done and what can be achieved today. And so there will be no theorem today, uh, but not because theorems are not good or not useful. It's because we are in a field which is trying to find its footing, and we can do many things in practice, but we don't know about how they work. And so I would like to put pointers for interesting questions in mathematics that some of you may be interested in pursuing. So I would like to act as a switchboard for people to find interesting problems. And today I'll talk about one particular application of visual recognition which has motivated our work in the last 10 years. Uh, it's called Visipedia. And in fact, I started this topic when I was a visitor at the University of Padova in 2009, when I was on sabbatical with my wife. And my wife was, in fact, in this building as a mathematician. So it's about many connections with, uh, with the slogan these people. <coughs> so what is Visipedia? Let me start from uh, the motivation side. OK, here. So when we go around um, living our lives and we look around ourselves, we find many uh, we find the images and we look around and we feel like we understand what we're seeing. Like here I'm seeing a room full of people. And here, uh, if I ask Lamberto, what does he see here? What does Lamberto say? What is Lamberto? A bird. Huh? A bird. A bird. says a bird. What about here? What, what do you see here? Uh, maybe 
Yeah, yeah. mouse. The mouse of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have no problem understanding what is there, and uh, teaching machines to do the same thing is not easy. But as you will see, we have uh, almost achieved it. Now there is one more level of um, one more level of performance, if you will, that is much more difficult for humans. I can never say, oh, this is a bird, but and I can say, okay, but which species of bird? I don't know. Some people here in the room may know what species of bird is it. Or I may look at this um, mole here. I know there are some doctors in the room, and so is this a mole that I have to go to the surgeon and have taken out? Is it dangerous for me or not? I don't know. Uh, who is this person? And so some people in the room may know and some may not know. And what is written here? And when was it written? And what's the script that was used? So there are, if we if we push. Um, we discovered we were very ignorant about the world. Okay? So it's not because information is missing. There are experts around the world who could tell us if this is a dangerous mole that I have to go to the surgeon to take out, or what's the species of a sperm, or who is this person. But the experts are not here with us. So the idea uh, of uh, visiting media is that we would like to harvest all of the world's visual expertise, make, make it converge to one spot, and then we can, any one of us can access, uh, access it anywhere, at any time, through, for example, our smartphone or through a call to an API on, uh, on the cloud. Okay? So it's a very Napoleonic point of view. We want to capture all of human expertise, visual expertise, and make it converge to one point, and have machines then dish out this information to us as if we had an expert of any subject uh, near us. So this would be a great thing to do. And we call this the Wikipedia project because it's like Wikipedia but in the world of images. So, uh, so today I'll take you through a few of the challenges that we meet and, uh, and tell you how we're thinking about them and how do we, do we tackle them. But before I start, I want to fake a demo. And so it's... Um, so you're uh, out on the on the Piavigo, and you see <laughs> you see a duck, and uh, okay, uh, it looks like a pretty duck. What kind of a duck is it? Is it a native duck of uh, Venice, or is it a duck that comes from the Italian somewhere? And uh, what you would like to do is be able to take uh, your smartphone, take a picture, and then the phone tells you what it is, right? And this would be the same for a skin vision, or it could be the same for a species of a tree. And actually my students, in the process of um, working on this project, have built uh, two apps that they invite you to download to your phone. And one is called Merlin Bird ID, and it's developed in collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it recognizes all the birds of Western Europe, North America, and Central America, and, uh, and it's growing. And one is called iNaturalist, and it recognizes all the wild plants and animals, but not really all, it's about 5,000, and it's the typical ones you find. And so typically, when you try to recognize something, you would be pleased, uh, because it's one of the common ones. And the goal is to go to about 500,000 plants and animals here, and the goal is to go to uh, 10,000 birds here. So let me show you the example. So this is, if you start the app, it looks this way. And you can take a photograph of the um, bird, and using your fingers, you can frame the bird within within a stringer, and then you say next, and then it asks you a couple more questions, but eventually it gives you an identification with a photo through which you can check yourself whether you believe what the machine did. So there is sort of a feedback loop uh, there. And um, and to show you that it works well in practice, this is what a friend of mine uh, in Pasadena sent me. So I showed her the app one evening for dinner. She put it on her phone. The next day she sends me this picture and says, oh, it works really well. It got the bird uh, correctly. And I thought, oh, what is the bird? Which, <laughs> and, and the bird is there. Uh, it's, it's there. And, uh, and this is the identification that we did. Um, and, and she says that she checked the bird with her um, binoculars and, uh, and they did it in her view it was correct and so on. But we know 
from ornithologists and birders that have, have the app works really well. So it does 95% uh, of accurate identification unless the photo is really, is really bad. Okay? So <clears throat> this is where we are right now with visual categorization. Not only we can recognize broad categories like um, cell phones and trees and Buddhas, but we can also uh, push the envelope and go down to individual species of birds or uh, there are other people who have done classification of skin lesion molds into, um, into um, malignant and uh, denied. So how does this work? And so we'd like to tell you how these applications work and then we get into more of the interesting questions of, of how do you, what are the, the issues that come up and how you solve them, how do you approach them. So here we have a photograph um, taken in nature. So how do you build a system that will um, detect and recognize the, the birds? So what do you do when you look at a picture like this? Well, that's what the machine does. So the first thing is we train the machine to, to detect birds in the general sense of birds without worrying too much about the species. And so the machine will detect each one of the individuals and we'll put some bounding box around it. Now, how is this done? But this is done through a deep network, and I'll come later to, um, to what is a deep network and how does it work. Um, and then once you have the bird in a box, uh, what happens? Well, there is another network that identifies the key points, the different landmarks on the body of the bird. And so it's a beak, shoulders, and so on. And once that is done, um, a third uh, triplet of networks looks at the head of the bird, at the body of the bird, and also at the image around the bird for context, and we see how important this is. And these three networks produce a vector of features, which is about a thousand numbers. And that vector may be classified into a species. So here you see for the first time a diagrammatic uh, display of a deep network <coughs> that we've seen before. And so you can think of, of this drawing as a function that, that takes uh, about a million numbers, the pixels of the image. And there are three channels, RGB. And so you have a function of a vector of about a million variables. It transforms it into a vector of about 100 to 1,000 variables, which are the features, namely descriptors that should be invariant with respect to all the accidental differences that have to do with pose and lighting, orientation, specimen, and so on. After which, um, this vector can be classified with a regular classifier. And we'll, we'll talk about classifiers in a moment. Okay, so the idea is that we deal with functions that go from very high dimensions to high, high-ish dimensions. And we need to um, construct these functions in some way, okay? If you look at Visipedia as a uh, system, then Visipedia is some switchboard in here, which takes questions from users and maps these questions to knowledge that can be accessed to these users through an image. So the question is an image and a machine will produce a pointer that can access information that is somewhere on the web about that particular object or it will just hand you back a pointer like the species name of the bird. Now, in order to make this work, well, the knowledge has to come from somewhere. And so that's a crucial question to address and we'll get later into it. And so there must be the possibility of the machine talking to experts in a proper way so that the experts are motivated to supply information. Also, the machine can hire people around the world to classify images uh, in as far as they can do it. And also, there are people like me who build automata and put them there. The machine has to train these automata to do the right thing, given the information that has available. So there are all of these components, and then I, I was forgetting there is also there are public databases of images that contain some labels that may be useful and so on. So there is a whole constellation of resources um, 
and the machine has to decide how to use these resources in order to, to make things work. Now for an even broader context, um, I want to show you this picture. So everybody talks about uh, artificial intelligence today. And the question is what's happening, you know, what is going on? And, and what people call artificial intelligence is, you know, it's dubious if there is really intelligence in the sense that we consider a human intelligent. Um, and we can discuss this later. Uh, but it's a stool with three legs. And so let me explain to you what are the components. And so one is deep networks that I just told you about. And those were inspired by neuroscience. And I have a slide to tell you a little bit more about that. And so these are the algorithms that are currently most popular for solving the kinds of sensory uh, problems that I was telling you about, including translation between languages, interpretation of language, translation of images into sentences and descriptions, translation of images into classifications and, and all of those things, sound and so on. Now the second um, agent of change is Moore's law, and this is no surprise, has been going on for a while. And without uh, GPUs, which were created for video games, um, we wouldn't have the current uh, line of thinking and research in artificial intelligence. So we need very powerful computers to achieve what we are achieving. And the third one is large annotated data sets, which are essential for training the machine. So the fuel that fuels what people call AI now is large annotated data sets. And these come from the fact that now we can index quickly images on the web. There are billions, trillions of images and video that we can access. And so we started this in, in my lab. We realized that this was a very important thing to do, collecting and annotating data sets. And Lamberto was mentioning Caltech 101. And then Fei Fei, my student, continued with uh, ImageNet, which is now one of the, which in fact was the catalyst of, of the big revolution of, uh, of AI in 2012. OK, so let's talk about deep networks for a moment. The inspiration is from neuroscience. And I know that there are neuroscientists here in the room. And there are many, um, many advances that people have made in neuroscience to understand how the brain works. Uh, crucially, um, understanding that individual neurons do some form of computation and realizing that action potentials are important elements of these computations. Understanding that neurons sometimes are tuned for specific properties of our environment, of our sensory input. And so some neurons may be sensitive to a certain frequency in uh, sound or some orientation. And then as processing goes on in cortex, neuron becomes, neurons become more and more refined and selective for specific properties that are interesting to us and have semantic value, like Lamberto space. David Manessen was my colleague at Caltech, and he was the first one to construct a detailed map of the propagation of signals through cortex from uh, the, vision, the eyes all the way up to areas in the brain where we make decisions. And there, there are many interesting facts about this architecture, but the one that I wanted to mention now is that um, there is um, there are, uh, it, it, you can think of it as a directed graph, and you have propagation of information that goes forward. There are also backwards uh, lines, but there are no loops. And so there, is, uh, there are other experiments showing you can do a lot with purely fit-forward processing from one map to another. And so this gives us a sense that these functions that we want to compute may be layers of subsequent units that compute something. And the fact that the anatomy of cortex is so regular makes us think that these functions may be highly regular themselves. And so the quest was on for a computational infrastructure that was simple at the local level, but concatenating simple computations would produce fairly powerful operators that we can use then to, to solve real problems. And so this uh, line of thinking in the computational world started with Frank Rothschild perceptrons in, um, in the 50s. And I'll, I'll get to the details of perceptrons, so don't try to kill your eyes trying to understand what is there on the, on the slide. And uh, Fukushima understood that he could concatenate various perceptrons to achieve higher level properties. 
And later, Nelly Kuhn realized that um, <coughs> by he could, he could train these deep perceptrons using gradient descent. And Jeff Hinton has done a million things, including a crucial experiment using ImageNet to demonstrate that perceptrons could classify complex images, which is what uh, sparked the current uh, enthusiasm for deep networks in AI. So I thought, um, since it's a broad public, I, I thought I would spend a moment to explain what these deep networks are. And um, luckily, the explanation is very simple. So we'll start from the, perceptor, from the perceptrons. And so think of classifying dogs and cats. And let's suppose that we have a vector of two variables that describe the animal we have. So think of an office of a veterinarian. The veterinarian will measure the weight and the length of each animal. And so the veterinarian takes note. And so let's think of this crazy problem in which the veterinarian has all of these measurements, but has forgotten which ones were the cats and which ones are the dogs. Is it possible to reconstruct back dogs and cats from the weight and the length? I see some people down there who are very concerned about this problem. OK, so here is uh, how you think about it. You have the length and you have the weight. And what you have to start with is some knowledge of what are the typical weights and lengths of, of these animals. And so what you would do is uh, you would go to a veterinarian friend of yours and you would say, well, tell me the weight and the length of all the dogs you've seen in the last month. And so the veterinarian says, sure, so here are all the lengths and weights of the dogs that have visited in my lab, my office in the last uh, month. And so you might have uh, a chihuahua here who is uh, uh, 20 centimeters and weighs two kilos, and you may have some Great Dane who is a meter and a half and, uh, and weighs 80 kilos, okay? Now you do the same with the cats that have visited the office. And, uh, and you obtain another spread of values that have to do with the cats. And now you start seeing a pattern here because you see that um, uh, for uh, the same length, the cats weigh less than the dogs or vice versa. If you think of, of the weight, um, the cats are longer. Somehow they're long, longer tail, they have lankier bodies, and so they're longer. And so you can indeed draw a line between uh, cats and dogs. And so now you get the confidence that if somebody handed to you a measurement of length and weight from a new animal without telling you if it's a dog or a cat, for example, this one, and they asked you, is it a dog or a cat? Pietro. A dog. A dog. It's a dog. It must be a dog. And um, <clears throat> OK. So how do you uh, make a machine do this? So suppose that you wanted to build a computer where you type in the weight and the height and you have a classification. You need to have a machine that is able to encode this idea that there is a line and if you're above the line, it's a dog and below the line is a cat. And, um, and the math is, of course, very simple. So you think of the equation of the line, y equals ax plus c. And you may write it in a in an implicit form, you think of z equals ax plus by plus c equals zero. And so if you write it this way, then zero is on the line. And positive might be the dog side, and negative might be the cat side. So you have a function z, a function of the two measurements. And, uh, and you know that if you estimated the function correctly, then uh, you plug in the two numbers, x and y, and you will get a positive number, and then you say dog. If you get a negative number, you say cat, okay? Very simple. And so now we may have to, and so there are these two regions of the plane, the dog region and the cat region. So there is one more step, which is the function is giving you out a, uh, li a linear value in the function of the variables. We need to transform this linear value into a decision. And so the idea is to use a nonlinearity, a zero one on linearity, it's like a thermostat that if the temperature in the room is below a certain level, the thermostat is not doing much. And if it goes above a certain level, the thermostat clicks and the air conditioning comes on. Okay, that's a nonlinearity. And so you have, uh, and now I draw the equation uh, I wrote before, I draw it in schematics. So you have the length times A plus the width, the weight times B plus a bias term C, and you pass it through a nonlinearity. Okay, 
So <clears throat> if you have the measurements of a cat, then linearity will say zero, and you interpret that as a cat. And if the um, measurements produce a positive value, then linearity says one, and you say, oh, it's a dog then, okay? So now we know how to build what is a perceptron. It's a very simple linear function followed by an elemental nonlinearity. And so the point is, this is the computational infrastructure we're going to use, and the one that people postulate maybe Cortex is doing, which is not true, but uh, still it's a nice uh, idealization. And, uh, <clears throat> and so now we think about how to tune this machine so that it does the right thing. Well, we saw it intuitively. We want to put a line in the right spot. And so we have to get some training examples, the ones I showed to you. And one uh, piece of advice is get lots of training examples because estimating those parameters is not easy. For example, if you had been lazy and you asked your friend, just give me the weights and heights of the dogs you saw and cats you saw in the last day, you might have achieved, obtained far fewer examples. And then in estimating the parameters, you might have put the line this way, which seems to be much more reasonable than the other way. And now if you put it this way, and now you start classifying dogs and cats, um, you might find yourself uh, in trouble. And these are more dogs and cats, and now the classifier is not working well. So you need lots of training examples. Now, <clears throat> Let's generalize this idea. Suppose that instead of just saying length uh, and weight, you get color and you get um, uh, the length of the teeth and the length of the nails and so on. Um, then you need more inputs. And so you can see that you can generalize in principle these inputs to be also all the pixels in one image or all the samples of a sound. Okay? So you could in principle give a million inputs here and you could try to classify the output. Now there is a problem. Uh, there are a number of problems, but let me first um, draw a little box around everything. So all the parameters are inside the box, and these two operations plus and linearity are inside the box. And so this is what people call a perceptron, a one layer perceptron. Okay, so what can it do and what can't it do? And early on in the 60s, people realized that there was uh, a problem with perceptron, not any problem, a shortcoming with perceptrons. So they can separate well sets of points that are linearly separable, of course, but um, if you have uh, a more complex situation, then they don't work so well. Because here, no matter how you put down your line, you're not going to separate out the cats from the dogs, for example, okay? And so why would you have the situation? There are no dogs that are longer and skinnier than the cats. Well, but you know, he, th these could be different animals, like these could be lizards, and these could be parrots, and so on. And so you have lots of animals, and you want to single out the cats, and so the cats are in a bubble in a sea of other examples. So clearly you cannot use a linear classifier. So there is a simple solution for that, it's a generalization of what we said before, which is to use many of these linear classifiers to draw boundaries around this convex set. So you can create a convex set out of these boundaries, and now, by combining in some way these, the outputs of these linear classifiers, you can classify this center. How do you do it? Well, if each linear classifier gives you a positive value, then it must be a cat. But if any of the classifiers gives you a negative value, or zero, then, then it's not a cat. Okay, so it's very simple. And so you look at the value of the output of the sum of the classifiers. Here is a four, a three, a two, and so on. And so if you think of combining these by summing them and subtracting three and a half, then you have a classifier that will tell you it's a cat. And so how could you do that? Well, it's another perceptron. It's a sum, weighted sum. So you put a weight of one on each one of them, and then a bias term minus three and a half, and you get a zero or a one in the output. So you can classify cats very easily. And so it's a perceptron acting on perceptrons or a two-layer perceptron like here. So you have all the different perceptrons and a new one here, and then you have the output. And now you can um, iterate to create more and more complex functions. For example, if you were interested in classifying dogs and cats versus everything else, well, there may be two convex sets, but the, the union of the two sets is not convex. But then if you have a classifier for dogs, which is a two-layer perceptron, 
one for cats, which is a two-layer perceptron. Then you can take an OR function, which means summing the two and subtracting one and a half, and you have a, um, a new uh, classifier. And so it's quite clear that by adding layers, you can add flexibility in the computations that can be done. So the idea is uh, that maybe this is the trick of the brain, namely there are simple computations and by concatenating these simple computations, you may get to higher level concepts that uh, may be not available in the earlier layers. Okay, so it turns out that these functions are very uh, practical and you can also build classifiers that will produce uh, multiple outputs. And for example, you might say, I want to classify all the possible animals I may ever meet. It's here for the sake of drawing, I drew only three. And so you could say that if the network will produce, oops, sorry, let me see. Okay, I'm missing a slide. So, so the network, it, th this is a cat, and so you expect that the network will produce a one here, a one here, a zero, and a zero. And so you have a code in the output, which is very simple. You expect the code to be all zeros apart from a one, and the one corresponds to the category you should declare, the category that belongs to, to which the image you're seeing belongs, um, and maybe the network will produce all zeros if it doesn't know what to say, okay? So this is the idea, so this is the requirement of a function, now how do you create such a function. And so first I wanted to show you um, typical architectures of such functions you see today. So this is one of them. And this was used last year. by Stanford and Google for classifying uh, skin moles. Um, and, um, and it produces a classifier in the end that can uh, decide which type of mole it is amongst 757 types which then get grouped into malignant and benign, and it turns out that in those experiments the network was doing better than dermatologists from Stanford universities and other uh, offices in the Bay Area uh, in uh, deciding whether patients should be, uh, that the mole should be taken out or not. Okay? But you see how many little boxes there are, so they're all small perceptrons, and in fact they're more complex than the ones I was showing to you because they deal with images that are vector value because they are right with blue, etc. So there are lots of parameters in here. There are tens, hundreds of millions of parameters to be tuned. Okay? So the job of building these functions is twofold. One is to decide on, on an architecture, which may be this one, or maybe a different one, and many architectures work well. And that's hocus pocus, which we'll try out as a giant biology experiment at the moment around the world. So there are thousands of very smart graduate students who are trying all possible architectures and some of them work better than other ones and then they say, okay, look at this one. And people call this uh, graduate descent, this method of research. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, once you've decided on a certain architecture, then there are methods for taking lots of getting images and, and, uh, and estimating the parameters in here. So both of these questions are, uh, are very interesting. Are very interesting and nobody knows exactly how to tackle them in a principled way. Uh, and so, you know, if you're looking for a PhD thesis, these are things that you may want to consider. This is the style of network that uh, is used for classifying uh, images of, uh, of dogs and cats and so on. It's a little bit different, but uh, again, you see that there is an image here, and then there are um, maps that go from one to the other. There are a few bells and whistles I'm not telling you about, but uh, it's the same idea as before. So each, let's call it a neuron or its unit here, uh, responds to a certain number of units in the previous map. Uh, and there are ways of connecting them. And again, you have uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of parameters. Now, as you know from uh, when people tell you to fit uh, a line or fit a parabola and so on to data, you always need more data than the number of parameters you're trying to fit. And the rule of the thumb is, well, you have to have five times, ten times more data than, than the number of parameters you have to fit. And it turns out that now people don't do that, they sometimes have more parameters, and so that you need ways to regularize your estimation to make it not go, uh, not go wrong. Um, 
So here I want to put in a plug for uh, Stefano Soatto, who is a, also a graduate of the University of Padova and now a professor at uh, UCLA. And he's one of the few people who are making progress on understanding the theory behind deep networks and optimization. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, there is an archive, you can start with this archive paper, 13th of December, 2017, uh, Mathematics of Deep Learning, which surveys uh, questions and results that there are out there in the, in the math literature for, for this topic. But uh, just to, I, I took a couple of equations from the paper just to tell you how people optimize, how people think about optimizing the networks, namely, how do the people pick the parameters that are in the network? And it's very simple. So you have parameters W, lots of parameters, and here they are um, labeled by layer. And then you have training examples divided into X and Y. X is the image and Y is the category. And you have a function phi, which is the map from X to Y. And you have a loss function that tells you how well is the network producing, transforming the images that you have into the labels you want to see. And so the loss function tells you, it's like a cost that tells you whether the network, which is represented by phi and the parameters, uh, is doing a good job. And so you want to minimize the loss function, so you want to minimize the distance between what the network is saying and what the ground truth labels are. And then you have some regularization here that says, well, the weights uh, shouldn't become too big, I should, should, many of them should be zero, a number of these constraints that help the estimation process. And, uh, and one active area of research is studying the shape of the landscape of this uh, loss function. And people know that there are some minima that are isolated points and some minima that are very shallow and big, and so the, the differential geometry of this problem is also quite interesting and people are trying to uh, understand it. And so there is a connection between differential geometry, between <coughs> stochastic differential equations to look at the trajectories of the optimizer in this uh, landscape, um, and um, information theory to see how, what is the right loss function. So here you see a loss function that is now becoming interesting, thanks to the work of Stefan, and it has to do with entropy. You see entropies and Karun and Loew uh, divergence and so on. And so there are uh, connections with um, um, probability and, and all of that. And so it's a very interesting topic. I will not say more about it today, but I wanted to make a, a connection. Okay, going back to uh, the Visipedia project, um, I want to briefly touch upon things that come up. And so one challenge is fine-grained categorization. So you know that there are Lots of species of birds that are very similar. Do these networks work well? And the answer is yes. You'll see data in a moment. Um, another challenge is the number of categories. There are about 10,000 bird species. And then if you, uh, if you think of all the things you may want to recognize, there are about 10 million estimated species of plants and animals. And then uh, there are maybe a billion different man-made objects. If you think of uh, carburetors of motorcycles built in 1927, to toothpaste boxes, um, I don't know what, instruments that you find at the dentist and you wonder what they are and so on. So there, are, there is a tremendous uh, diversity of objects made by humans, and so you would, you know, somebody will recognize them, so why shouldn't a machine do it? And then you have famous buildings, the Portello, the Golden Gate Bridge, and so on. Uh, there are celebrities, and so I'm told at Amazon that there are half a million celebrities. And so I thought, oh, how can you be a celebrity if it's one of half a million? But apparently that's the, the number. Um, and then, uh, you know, Chinese characters and dishes in all cuisines, Le Sardin Saor, and so on. And then you have um, landscapes, Mala Marmolada, uh, half, half Dome, and so on. And so you can think of all the things that people recognize, and you get a big number. And so in my mind, there could be maybe 100 million or a billion things that you would want a machine to recognize. Now, this is the academic point of view, right, in which you want to do everything. From the uh, point of view in industry, well, you always have a fairly limited number of questions you want to, to handle in industry, right? It's much more focused. And so, but uh, as an academic, I like to think about these big questions, you know, is, is it possible at all? 
The more subtle challenge is this one. I told you that you need lots of training examples, but um, if you look at the distribution of, of the photographs of birds we have by species, here we sorted the species by how frequent uh, the photographs of that species are. You see some species that have lots of photographs, 10 to the 4, and some species, the majority, have very few photographs, less than 10 photographs. This is a data set of about a million pictures. We now have three and, three and a half million pictures. Um, our machines require between 100 and 1,000 images <laughs> to do well. And so uh, what you see is that the great majority of species, so here is from 1,000 to 10,000, has fewer than the number of images we need to do well on those images. Okay? So this is a very big problem. And it's not a problem of trying harder to collect more images. It's the problem is that the world is intrinsically a long tail distribution. So those of you who are in statistics, they're fam you're familiar with this concept that you know, there are long tail distributions. And so if you think of the diseases that doctors have to face, there are some that they see all the time, and there are some that only a few doctors around the world will ever see. And if you think of the size of the files on your computer, it's the same way. There are uh, uh, many files that are small, so there's a burst, and a few files that are really big, and so on. So the, the things that you will see in the world, there are a few uh, items that are very frequent, and some and most are infrequent. And, uh, but the fact is that humans can learn with very few training examples. So if you ask somebody who is passionate about birds, how many images do I need to give you to train you to recognize birds? They say, well, you know, give me five or 10 images and I should be able to, to make do, uh, or flowers or plants and so on. So we know that our machines are up here and humans are down here. There's a factor of at least 100 in the efficiency with which humans can learn better than machines. And so this is a very good question. How do, how do machines um, do it so, so well? Uh, how do humans do it so well? And so this is another interesting problem, and I frankly don't know where is the, where is the crucial aspect. I have ideas, but I don't know, I don't know how to solve it. Let me skip this. Okay, so, um, so fine grain categorization, it turns out, is fairly easy. The number of categories is quite easy, but this long tail problem is really difficult. And um, I want to move. We have about 12 minutes. Um, <clears throat> one is how do we get information from experts? And the question is the machine is contacting humans. And how should the machine trust that um, the human is an expert? Okay, so if we go to the doctor to get, um, again, a mole inspected or we have some disease or whatever, the doctor tells us something and we may have confidence, but sometimes you think, oh, does the doctor really know what they're talking about? How do we, how do we establish trust with the doctor? And so one way that people use typically is ask a second doctor. If the two doctors agree, then you get more confidence for uh, for, the, for what the first doctor said. And so let me show you what the machine does. Um, okay, here is a task we give people on the web. And so this is like a psychology experiment. So we have two species of birds that are similar. One is called indigo bunting and one is called blue grosbeak. And so some people in the room may already see what is different between these birds, but most people will have trouble deciding what is what is a blue gross beak and what is an indigo bunting. So we let people study the problem using example images for about 15 minutes. And then we ask them to label a whole bunch of pictures. And um, this is what we see. Each dot is a person. And here we, since we know the ground truth, here is the rate of correct detection and here is the rate of correct rejection uh, that people give us. So the best performance is up here correct rejection, namely, when you have to say, so we ask them, is this an indigo bunting? And um, if they say yes, when it's a, an indigo bunting each time, they get a high rate of correct, sorry, correct detection. And if they say no, when it's a no, then they get a high rate of correct rejection. So again, think of a doctor looking at the mole on your skin. Is it cancerous or not? If the doctor is very good at saying yes, when it's cancerous, then they get a high rate of correct detection. And if they're very good at telling you, don't worry, go home, when it's not, 
so they don't make you take moles out that uh, shouldn't be taken out and they have a high rate of correct rejection. Okay, and as you can see, people are all over the place. And so you might say, this is what the machine is facing. You know, people who claim to be experts may be experts or maybe not experts. And the machine has to estimate these quantities. And I'll tell you in a moment how we, we think about it. So here are these curves are summing the errors that people make in rejection and detection. And here you have the competent annotators. And these are going completely at random. They're 50-50. And these are people, we call them optimists. They're always saying yes. <laughs> and therefore, they get a fantastic rate of correct detection. So it's like a doctor that takes out every mole that comes into the office. They get paid uh, more, but uh, they, they do create more scars. And these are the pessimists, and they say no all the time. OK, so how do you use it? And, and the idea is that um, if two pessimists say yes, then it's a strong signal for yes. But if two pessimists say no, then it's almost no signal at all, right? So that, that's a type of situation. So if people are into Bayesian inference networks in this department, and I don't know if anybody is, this is what um, you will like. Um, here is how we think of what goes on inside the head of, of an expert. ZI is the binary label for the image. Is it uh, an, an indigo bunting or not? Or is it cancerous or not? LIJ is the label given by annotator or by Dr. J for image I, and that's something we can see. And we want to, from these labels that many doctors may give us about the same patient, we may want to come up with what's the state of the patient. And the idea is that each doctor has a vector of measurements in their head, and this is the vector of measurements that corresponds to the best doctor. And this is a vector of ma measurements in the head of the typical doctor, which is corrupted by some noise. And again, I say doctor, but it could be somebody looking at birds or whatever. So doctors typically are very good and very consistent. Um, and so J is the index of the doctor. This is the amount of noise. And you have other parameters in the head of the person. One is the classifier that they use. What is the criterion they use to take these measurements and transform it into a label? And this is the bias, which is are they more optimistic or pessimistic, OK? Now, the idea is that if you model things this way, you can estimate these parameters, and which you're not necessarily interested in. But estimating these parameters and knowing who is a good expert and who is a bad expert allows you to estimate the ground truth with greater, much greater accuracy. And so these are experiments we run on a website where people upload pictures of um, uh, wild species and where they classify birds and lizards and butterflies and so on. And we have real biologists identify the, bird, the, the pictures and then and therefore we know how correct these people are. This is the error rate, so down here is good. And the machine is able to estimate exactly these parameters. This is the estimation of the machine and you see they're all on a straight line. Okay, so. Even without knowing the ground truth, the machine is able to go in and look inside the head of the people who are working with the system. And the more they work, the more the machine is aware of what are their strengths and weaknesses and what do they do well and what they do not don't do well. And therefore, it knows whom to trust for a certain task and uh, whom not to trust. OK, so <clears throat> I want to go a little bit quickly here because we are running out of time. Let me show you things that don't work and why they don't work. So here is an example taken from Clarify. This is a website where you can submit the images to obtain um, labels that have to do with the image. And so I read it for the people in the back of the room. Here is a, an image of a cow. And the system says cow, milk, agriculture, farm, cattle, livestock, dairy, beef, hay field, and so on. Okay, pretty good. And here you have cow, beef, agriculture, cattle, milk, pasture, mammal, livestock, and so on, farmland. So, <clears throat> If you submit your images to this machine, it does impressively well in telling you what is in there. So why would you care? You know already. Well, because this is for machines to use to, for example, advertise things to you or help a biologist in the field sort their pictures and so on, right? So it's to automate the process of knowing what is there in the pictures. Okay. But since I know how this works, I know exactly how to make it fail. And so here is Failure. Now I took another three images of cows, 
and I put them in the same system, and now the system is in trouble. It only says cow once, and it's not even the first thing it says. It's sort of down here, it's not very sure. And here it's missing out the cows, okay? So Pietro, what did they do here to make the system fail? Don't know. Okay, related to the environment. So what I did, I know that these machines are trained with lots of examples, and so what they learn is in a somewhat pedestrian way what they have seen before. They are unable to generalize well, and therefore I thought, okay, I bet you that there are many images of cows on grass and very few images of cows on beaches, so if I feed the machine with cows on beaches, I may make it fail, and it does fail, okay? It's not easy to make it fail, but here I was able to make it fail. So here we reveal the weakness of these machines. They are not good at generalizing because they are learning from huge training sets and they're not asked to make any specific um, abstraction from the images they, they get. And so the question of how do we make abstractions and how do we know the cause and effect, what causes the person to say cow is very interesting. And so, um, so let me um, conclude with one last issue, which is this, this one of, uh, of causation. And so, uh, so again, I'm picking on Pietro here because I is simpatico. And he's a doctor. So how, uh, what do you think of this person? What, uh, how does he feel? Pietro. Does he feel well? No, he doesn't feel well. Okay. <laughs> and so why, why do you think he doesn't, doesn't feel well? What makes you think that? There are doctors. Okay. And also he's lying down on a bed, right? Okay. Doesn't feel well because there are doctors and he's there on the bed. So if, if the doctors and the bed make him feel bad, then he will feel better as soon as we send out the doctors and we get him out of bed. <laughs> Very simple. Okay, what happened here? Well, here we mistook a correlation for a causation. So correlation means the two things happen together. When somebody's sick, they're in bed. And a causation is which one of the two makes the other one happen? Is it being in bed that makes you feel sick? Or is it being sick that makes you feel like you should go to bed? Which way does it go? And machines now cannot do this. They just look at correlations. And so we saw the machine being very stupid with correlations with the cows. In general, correlations, if you've seen things before, then it's perfectly fine for making predictions. But if you want to make the machine to have a body and go out in the world and make changes, then you need to understand causation because you need to know what to change if you want something else to change. And so let me spend two minutes on this topic to show you a little way of reasoning. So the definition of, uh, and so some of you may, may know about this, but the um, definition of causality, has, there are many definitions attempted by mathematicians, but the one that is best, I think, is the one due to, due to Judea Pearl in the last 15 years. He's been active. He's a professor at UCLA. He's very active in this, and sort of he's a founder of a modern study of causality. And so here is the idea. With this diagram, I show you um, uh, the, the a correlation between um, being in bed and having a fever. And with this type of arrow instead, I want to show you uh, causation, okay? Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, if I have correlation, I can draw either an arrow this way or that way. It doesn't matter. It depends on whether I'm interested in representing the conditional probability of being in bed condition on having a fever or the conditional probability of uh, of having a fever condition on being in bed, okay? So there is nothing wrong with uh, that point of view, the correlational point of view. Both are very legitimate points of view. What's the probability? Condition on the fact that my friend is in bed at 10 in the morning, what's the probability that they have a fever? That's a perfectly valid question. Or condition on the fact that I know my friend has a fever, what's the probability they're in bed right now? I can reason about both, there's no problem. But uh, causation only goes one way, okay? So how do we make this uh, stick in, in uh, formal ways? And then also, uh, how do we make a machine, enable a machine to learn about causation? And, uh, and here is the idea. So there are variables we may observe, like having fever, being in bed. And there are variables we may not observe. Maybe there is a flu that causes a fever that in turn causes the person to be in bed, or maybe the person was working at night and then they're in bed in the morning, and maybe working hard causes them to have a fever, maybe. 
So there may be uh, different uh, variables, some of which cause other variables to happen. And if I want to study causation, I have to carry out an experiment. What does it mean to carry out an experiment? It means bringing the whole preparation to the lab and cutting the links one by one and studying what happens when I cut the links. And so I cut all the links and I can say, well, how does fever, does fever cause being in bed or vice versa? And so what I can do is I can start by saying, well, let me give this person an antipyretic. I'll take the fever away. Will they get out of bed? and I observe it, yeah, they get out of bed. Versus, I may uh, say, well, get out of bed and let's take the fever again. Did, he, did the fever go away? No, so I've done an experiment and now I know which way uh, causation happens. And so can we do the same with machines? Can we let machines learn the same way? And, um, and so these are the last few slides of my talk in case Lamberto is worried that I'm going <laughs> grossly over time. Um, <coughs> so here is the problem. Nature gives us an association between, say, images and labels. And so again, these are various uh, diagnostic uh, uh, things, and this is you know, what's the right causal uh, situation. And we are training our classifiers, and so we are prey of correlation. We could do no causation. Uh, but the way a machine could handle it is this. Well, nature is giving us this association, but as we saw before, if we just rely on nature to give us these associations, we just learn about correlations. We need to be able to influence nature. And so here is one way to do it. You want to bring your preparation in the lab and study, generate automatically, to manipulate these, uh, these uh, variables and see how they associate with the effects. And so let me show it to you um, in practice. So I think you have a deep network and you have learned some parameters and now you have a classifier. Maybe there is a way to look uh, inside the classifier and try to understand what is the classifier using to map uh, onto the label. For example, for the cows, we've seen that it's looking at the grass as well as the animal to create uh, the association. And now we can manipulate the image and we can show grass to humans and we can ask humans, do you see a cow? And the human may say yes or no, okay? So the idea is to take um, the, what we know about the classifier and generate artificial images, here they are, which then we can uh, use to test, again, in this case, humans, to see if they give us the same label. And now the classifier will be trained with a much better set of images, or of uh, pairs of images and labels, and we'll know about causality. Let me show you this in a simple example and then I conclude. So this is an example by my student, uh, Shristof Haupka. So if you're interested in causality, you can look at the papers uh, by Shristof. Um, this is the MNIST data set that everybody's using in um, computer vision when they start, or machine learning when they start learning about uh, classifiers. And these are basically 60,000 images of digits that were taken from letters sent in the US in the 80s. Okay, so it's 110 digits from nine uh, to zero. And what we do is we take the machine that is trained to classify these digits perfectly. Now the machine is better than the humans, makes 0.2% errors, while humans make 0.3 or 0.4% errors. Um, we can tell the machine, okay, uh, starting from one of these images, try to manipulate the image in such a way that you will make a human say, a different label. So what's the minimal change that you can make to a nine by flipping pixels so that you can make a human say zero? If you know how to do that, then I can say that you know what the digit is. If you just classify the digits, I don't know what, uh, what you know. And so initially the machine um, uh, doesn't do very well. So it turns out that one of those classifiers that classifies perfectly the digits can be much, uh, more, can be easily fooled by just flipping a couple of pixels on or off. The fact is that it has never seen images with a few pixels on or off. And so by turning those on or off, which I can find out by taking partial derivatives of the label with respect to the input, um, we can fool the machine very easily. Okay, so what looked like a perfect classifier is terrible. It's like the cow experiment in which 
I modify something that has never been modified before and the machine flips out and says, oh, this is a two, or this is a three, or this is a four, and so on, okay? But if I let the machine produce these phantom images and send them to humans and ask them, what do you see, and let the humans um, respond, and then feed this information back to the machine, very quickly, the machine improves, and it's able to make minor modifications to the original digits, or the minimal modifications, that produce the output that we were looking for. So the machine now starts looking, starts understanding better cause and effect. Okay, so um, let me skip this and go to the conclusions. So I told you about the Visipedia uh, project, I told you about the problem of long tails, which is an open problem. How do you model what goes on in the head of experts, and so how can the machine learn how to assess whether somebody knows what they're saying and making use of their expertise and discarding the wrong things that they say. And I've told you about causation and correlation. I've showed you some examples where uh, these wonderful machines that we're building are not working well at all, and so that you realize that there is no real artificial intelligence. You don't have to worry, worry yet that machines are about to take over the world, but uh, at some point we will uh, make them better. Okay, thank you. Great. Questions. Thank you. We have time for questions. Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for giving us this lecture. And um, I have a question. Maybe it's out of topic. I don't know because it's not strictly um, image recognition, but it's more like AI. So, for example, um, I think a very famous case of uh, artificial intelligence was. Um, a very recent, uh, I think, uh, experiment from OpenAI. I guess you know him, them. And they did an experiment where they trained uh, an AI to play like a mobile game, Dota, which was uh, very, very complex uh, in comparison to like uh, all the other games that were generally, tr um, were maybe um, already solved by AI, like, I don't know, chess or other things, right? So they have very much more parameters. So my question is, when training like an AI to do some uh, decision making uh, in real time, is it just um, perhaps a um, um, problem of computation? Like it requires like, it's basically the same problem of image recognition and it's uh, like tackled with the same techniques but with just mo much more computing power because it has to do, I mean, decision making with much more variables or is it just, um, uh, fundamentally very different problem and it's tackled in the whole other uh, ways. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is a, a beautiful question. And so just to rephrase your question in my own words is um, uh, the following. So we, right now we are training machines uh, to be extremely accurate in reproducing the statistics of uh, the training set. Okay. And uh, we are not putting into the loss function anything having to do with the computational cost or the speed with which a decision may be made. Now, if you take organisms that work uh, in the real world, being fast is extremely important. And in fact, there is a trade-off between being right and being quick. So if you think of, if you feed some pigeons some breadcrumbs, you will see that the pigeons, the faster pigeon gets the breadcrumbs, and sometimes they will peck in the wrong spot because they are very fast, but at least they have a chance of getting the breadcrumb. It's a pigeon who is always right but always late will never be never eat anything. And um, uh, so there are two or three thoughts. So from purely the economical standpoint, there are um, huge companies like um, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and so on, that process oodles of images. Like uh, there are about a billion images loaded into Facebook every day, and each image is processed by a number of these deep networks because they want to detect objects, they want to detect faces, identify the faces, etc. All of those CPU cycles are expensive. It's about a dollar per hour. And so if you could cut, and these companies have certain margins, some companies make a lot of money, but say Amazon Web Services that gives you the service for commercially, um, tries to be very inexpensive. And so if you could cut in half the cost 
of uh, those computations, you can save many billions in gigawatts of power every year. So there is true economic incentive in figuring out how to lower the computational cost and how, make it, how to make decisions faster. Uh, think of automated driving, for example, their decision. Then. Okay. So there are maybe two or three different um, approaches to this problem. One says, well, once we've trained this big network with lots of weights, we can put inside the cost function a term that says that um, computations are expensive and it wants to reduce them. And so you could try to drive as many weights in the network to zero as possible, or you could try to make the number of layers that you compute as small as possible. So there is a, pa a paper by one of my students, Mason McGill, that came out, came out six months ago that looks at this problem of can I may take decisions earlier? And some decisions may be much quicker to take than others. And so instead of going down this long chain of computations, may I stop early and make up my mind there? So this is one point of view. <coughs> A second point of view is um, looking closer at neurobiology. And as you know, the brain computes with action potentials. And it's believed that when um, a computation is not going to go well, action potentials don't propagate any longer. So if you show a, a face to a person, then the signal goes all the way up in the brain, many stations. If you show to a person a noise pattern, then the signals stop in V1 and they don't propagate further. So there is a process of selection of these action potentials and only the ones that are meaningful are let through. And so that's another, another line of thinking that people are looking for. How do we um, only send up the statistically significant uh, bits? And so if you're interested, I can give you another pointer to the literature later. Yes. Going back to your last uh, uh, part, when you discussed this, uh, um, uh, the idea of uh, introducing some causal manipulation of the, of the stimuli, uh, so that in principle, th this should lead you to a better classifier, I, I guess, I presume in the end. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I find it um, rather striking that there are some uh, adversarial examples, this is the issue actually, it may be, it's a bit technical, right. but that where we don't even see uh, ourselves as human uh, observers, the difference. the difference between the original image right. and the adversarial example that fools the right. classifier. So this doesn't this suggest to you that there's something intrinsically wrong in the way we train this classifier, which have, have always uh, uh, a task uh, they have uh, they have to put yes. a label as objective function as a learning function which yeah. is not what we do as humans right we, we don't learn mm. to recognize things to name them we eventually we also get to name them but that's not how we learn that's to right. recognize objects okay yeah so um, so so the answer is yes and no so the uh, the yes part is uh, of course um, in the training sets we have, we have not thought about all the possible variations on the theme that it could be in nature. And so adding noise to the image is a good way to immunize yourself from these false examples, for example. And so what, what happens there, you're taking your training examples and you're making the training set a little bit thicker in the space where it uh, happens to be. And then we have generalization to areas of space where no training image was ever seen, and even if we thicken out the training set, we don't get there. I think that current algorithms are singularly unaware of those blank spots, which are the majority of space, and so we should think better about how to code for, I haven't seen this before, I, I'm refusing judgment or something like that. Um, then there are some invariances that I think we should bake into the architecture of these networks, and we know how to build invariances for translation using convolutional codes, but we don't know how to bake other invariances, and so that's going to happen in the next few years, and compositionality and all of those beautiful things that are probably up here. And so it's going to be a mixture of little tricks to make things better, but also fundamental understanding, and I, I sympathize with your point of view.
So a very related question uh, to this last one is uh, uh, the um, observation that you were doing about the amount of images that you need to provide to a network in order to learn. So you yeah. must are uh, much better from this point of view. So my question is, uh, even now in deep network for uh, visual uh, uh, recognition, you have uh, sort of uh, a priori knowledge because you can uh, use uh, some pre-trained uh, network and then you start from there and then you uh, specialize the network to specific tasks. Uh, so is it possible that humans have uh, much more knowledge, much more a priori knowledge encoded that is actually using right. uh, uh, when performing the, the classification or, right. or can we do something similar? Right, right, right. So um, let me show a picture because it's also a very good point. Um, so how do we generalize better? And um, I had this picture that I didn't spend enough time talking about. So in order to achieve um, good performance, um, the network has to see all of these variants of a given species, in this case it's a chickadee. And sometimes the chickadee is flying right, sometimes flying left, uh, hanging up, uh, you know, upside down one way or upside down another way and so on. Now as humans, once we have seen this, we can generalize to other birds, like if you've never seen a, a penguin hang upside down from a branch, you have no problem, like if, if there was a penguin in this room hanging upside down from the projector, you would say, who put a penguin hanging upside down from the projector? You wouldn't say, oh, I don't know what I'm seeing. So uh, how, how do we take advantage of the abundant examples and generalize out to, to the, um, the ones you have not seen? So there are two extreme points of view. One extreme point of view is to say, oh, we just haven't found the right loss function but if, we, if I was able to write a loss function that tells the system, not only learn this, but also be good at generalizing, like, you know, I have some test inside the loss function for whether the generalization is good, new images, and so on, then maybe things will be better. That's one extreme point of view. The other extreme point of view is to say, look, you know, deep networks are great, but they're not meant to generalize. They're just a tool for learning a mapping from features we observe to, to labels. And now we have to go back to um, classical computer vision and start reasoning about structure and also how to learn structure automatically because, of course, I can learn a lot about birds, but then I have to deal with automobiles, carburetors, trees, and so on. <clears throat> and so what is it that uh, helps a system learn the general structure within a, um, a field, a domain of expertise? And maybe there is a taxonomy like in the animal kingdom in which you know, birds are shaped in a certain way and mammals in another way. And I can learn knowledge that is taxonomized and I learn in a course to find way. So what is it that we have to do? And, and so this is again going to be, I'm sure that there are people uh, working on that, like my students are working on that uh, at the moment. And so we will see which way it goes. It's interesting, psychologists know this, I've known this for a while. Like if, if I ask you what is this, you say, okay, it's a bird, right? That's the first thing that comes to mind. Now, if I showed you a penguin and I say, what is that? You would say, it's a penguin. And so there are three or four birds, like penguin, ostrich, and pelican, where everybody says the species. They don't say, oh, it's not really the species, but almost. Uh, while for most other birds, they say it's a bird. Why? Well, because those birds are different in shape from the typical bird, and some of the rules for birds don't apply. I mean, I'm giving you my explanation. Um, and, um, and so the, what psychologists call the entry-level categorization is different, is set aside from the regular birds. And then you say, but is it a bird or not? Oh yeah, of course it's a bird. But why did you say penguin? Well, because it's a penguin and so on. So um, probably there is something going on here that allows us to put together things that are alike, pull out things that are different, and then build up our knowledge in a very structured way. And, and we should be looking for that. First line. You can try also. Yeah. So I, uh, I want to um, actually um, complete maybe uh, his, his question because I found the topic very interesting and the things that you said. So basically we have like these two points of view. One in which we think, okay, we just don't have the right architecture of deep networks um, to allow more complex problems like generalization, like having I know um, 
getting the machine to get you know, to, to the structure of the bird and so on and so on. And the other side, as you said, uh, we can see that, okay, uh, maybe deep networks are not the right tools to use. We should uh, go back to, I mean, uh, to classical computation and to see like relationships and stuff. So my question is, can we see like um, the, the architecture as um, just a limit of uh, like a perfect ideologic, um, I don't know, of, um, of the other architecture. So let's say we, ha we create a very intricate, very perfect logic uh, that says, uh, that gets some parameters, like I don't know, uh, something that we can infer from the pictures, like the shape of the um, bird and so on. And we create, um, even though it's like theoretically very <laughs> a very strenuous work, but we can create, at least in theory, a very intricate logic uh, that actually points out uh, this is a bird and actually can in, uh, extract as much information as possible from the model. So can we just see like um, a deep network, just like the limit of this structure that actually we just see from, uh, it, it just creates from random, right? From uh, random, um, uh, very, from uh, very, very, uh, from random assignment of the parameters uh, of, uh, of the algorithms. I know, uh, it's very complex uh, to explain. Yeah, I don't know if I understand your question. So, yeah. is that, are you talking about unsupervised learning or? Well, no, I'm talking about uh, like this, this two concepts that you discussed earlier. I'm uh. just saying, can we just see one as um, just the limit of the other? I don't know. It's very, it's, I think it's, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not so good enough at talking. <laughs> let's do, I think that there is a coffee hour so we can pick it yeah. up uh, at, the, at the coffee hour. Okay, after this, this is the announcement. So uh, first of all, <laughs> let's thank again Pietro. Yeah. Okay, so now we are going to have a coffee break at the top, so at the seventh floor. And the very last announcement, we are going to have the next uh, colloquia. It's going to be after the summer, so probably in the fall. So stay tuned. Okay, thank you.